I call on Government Order of the Day number three. Exclusive Economic Zone and Continental Shelf Environmental Effects Transitional Provisions Amendment Bill Interrupted Debate on Second Reading. Members, when we were last debating the second reading of the Exclusive Economic Zone and Continental Shelf Environmental Effects Transitional Provisions Amendment Bill, Todd Muller was speaking and has seven minutes remaining, should he so wish. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Todd Muller. Uh, Mr Speaker, I rise to make uh, some concluding remarks uh, on the second reading of the Exclusive Economic Zone and Continental Shelf Environmental Effects Transition Provisions Amendment Bill. Uh, and uh, if I could ask the House that perhaps I'll just reference it as the bill uh, uh, from now on. Uh, Mr Speaker, the bill makes uh, a small technical amendment to the Act to ensure sensible transition of existing petroleum operators into the new regime. Uh, Mr Speaker, we have four petroleum op uh, production operators uh, in the EEZ, uh, all off the coast of uh, uh, Taranaki, that fantastic area that of course is incredibly well served by Barbara Kuruga, uh, and all crucial for New Zealand's uh, oil and gas supply. All have been operating well, Mr Speaker, but need to be seamlessly brought into the regime uh, without uh, compromising uh, their supply. Uh, Mr Speaker, the uh, current transitional provisions in the EEZ and Continental Shelf Environmental Effects uh, Act require existing operators uh, to undertake their uh, marine consenting process uh, before their pre-existing permits expire. Uh, and this bill simply allows for operators to continue operating while their new marine consent applications are being considered uh, by the EPA. Uh, and it also provides certainty of operation through any subsequent uh, objections and appeals. And of course, that's potentially where we are uh, at the moment uh, uh, with STOS. Uh, I think what's really important, uh, Mr. Speaker, though, is to note that the bill does not change the requirement to apply for a marine consent. Operators are still required to provide an impact assessment uh, on the nature of their activities and are still required to identify measures to avoid, remedy uh, or mitigate uh, any adverse uh, effects, Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Select Committee spent uh, quite a lot of its time uh, reflecting on the transitional provisions, uh, particularly uh, of the current Act, Section 162, uh, and if I can quote that, that allows existing petroleum mining activities involved in structures or pipelines and permitted under the Crown Minerals regime to continue without a marine consent for the duration of the operator's mining permits or privileges as they were on the day before uh, that Act came into force. But critically, Mr Speaker, it did not allow existing uh, operators to continue their activities while a marine consent application is being considered and any appeals being determined. Uh, so, um, as you would expect, um, uh, Mr Speaker, that uh, was uh, a challenge uh, for us and we needed to resolve that. We can't have uh, situations where ex existing operators needed to have essentially been granted a marine consent um, uh, before their mining permit or privilege uh, expires and finding themselves uh, uh, potentially continuing operating uh, in breach. So uh, we spent uh, quite a lot of uh, time, Mr Speaker, uh, reflecting uh, as a select committee on whether essentially uh, the current operators could game the framework in any way by delaying the time of their application for a new permit and consent until the very last moment uh, and then tie up uh, the review process in le years of legal wrangling. I guess there was both a legal perspective that was brought to the debate by members of the committee and those who were providing uh, submissions, uh, but also uh, I think at, at times the debate lacked uh, a f a commercial rigour. Uh, because uh, from my perspective, Mr Speaker, uh, just reflecting on some of my experience in recent years, particularly in Fonterra, the idea uh, that when you have such a significant part of your business at stake uh, that is being enabled by a particular consent or permit, the fact that you would deliberately uh, wait to the very last minute 
uh, to put in an application um, is, uh, is very unlikely and certainly from my experience um, just simply doesn't happen because the business continuity risks are significant uh, and if you're in a commercial uh, world, uh, your senior management and indeed your governors hold your feet to the fire to ensure that you're managing your uh, regulatory compliance and particularly any uh, consents and the rollover of those in a way that absolutely uh, assures uh, business continuity. So some of the debate, Mr Speaker, in the Select Committee uh, around the fact that uh, somehow our uh, 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 oil and uh, petrol producing uh, companies would be gaming this uh, by trying to wait to the very, very last minute uh, simply didn't wash with uh, me. But we did uh, amend Clause 4, Mr Speaker, of Section 162 of the proposed bill uh, to require existing operators to apply for a marine consent nine months prior uh, and that that application be acknowledged and as complete by the EPA. There was quite a lot of debate as to whether this would be six months or nine months or 12. Uh, I, I, I think we have landed in the right spot. Uh, and uh, I think the credit for that actually should uh, go to our chairman, uh, Mr Scott Simpson, who yet again has shown that he has a very good way of managing a process that gets the right outcome in terms of a legisla legislative outcome, uh, reflecting on the various perspectives in the room, and I think we've got an outcome there uh, that will work uh, quite well. We have further amended uh, Clause 4 by putting in a new Section 1625, Mr Speaker, to clarify that um, existing mining activities past the expiry date of a mining permit or privilege could continue until the application was decided by the EPA and appeals were determined. Uh, and I think that is, um, that is very useful. Uh, perhaps the only um, um, closing comment, Mr Speaker, uh, we had a number of submitters. Uh, most of them were um, you know, uh, perhaps light in terms of understanding the details of this. PPANS, uh, of course, was not very supportive of, of change, but I think one message they could take away from our Select Committee deliberations is that they do have a role, uh, in my view, in working with uh, the uh, oil companies to ensure that they are uh, very aware of their obligations in terms of timing and sequencing of their particular uh, consent renewals. Uh, there was just a touch uh, of a bit of a hands-off approach from PIPANS, which uh, I think uh, did not particularly serve them well. Uh, Mr Speaker, I look forward to this uh, uh, bill progressing through the House.